16 by Matthew Paul, entitled The Satisfaction of Christ Discussed. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, Colossians 1.20. The apostle, having congratulated the Colossians on their faith and love and other graces, and poured forth a prayer for them in verses 9 to 14, he enters upon a declaration of the gospel mystery, the person and offices and work of Christ. His person, in verses 15 to 7, he is God, etc. His office, in verse 18, he is head of the body, the church. And his work, in verse 20, having in verse 19 asserted Christ's fitness for the work, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, etc. Besides that infinite fullness which he had as God, by natural and necessary generation, there was another unmeasured fullness, depending upon God's eudoxia and good pleasure, and thereby imparted unto Christ. Now he comes to show his work described. 1. By its nature, to reconcile to himself, to make peace. 2. By its instrument, that is, by the blood of the cross, by him. 3. The object of it, which are all things which, whether they be in things in heaven, earth, or things in heaven, by which learned Davenport understands the angels spoken of as the things in heaven, and so many others, supposing that the elect angels were confirmed in their estate by Christ. But with submission to better judgments, I conceive, one, that there is not sufficient evidence in Scripture to show that the holy angels had their confirmation from Christ. Nor does it seem to be necessary, for as much as it is commonly acknowledged that Adam, who was under the same covenant with the angels, if he had continued in the observation of God's precepts for so long a time as God judged me, he should have confirmed by virtue of the covenant of works some other way. And therefore it was rather to be thought that the angels had their confirmation from Christ as God and head over all things than as mediator. The actions of Christ as mediator, supposing a breach, according to that place, Galatians 3.20, a mediator is not a mediator of one, that is, of two parties, which are one politically, that is, which are agreed in one, but of parties of variance. Two, howsoever, if the angels had been confirmed by Christ, yet surely they were not reconciled by Christ, for reconciliation implies a form of enmity, as these things in heaven are said to be. And therefore I rather understand it of departed saints, Patriarchs, prophets, etc., who as they went to heaven, not to any limbus, so this expression is used to insinuate that they were saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, even as we, as it is in Acts 15.11, and that the blood of Jesus Christ did expiate not only those sins which were committed after his death, but those also which were long since past, Romans 3.25. The light and influence of the sun is dispersed among us before the body of the sun did appear above our horizon. So then, here you have man's reconciliation, justification and salvation described, together with the procuring cause of it set forth. One, more generally, by him. Two, more specifically, by the blood of his cross, by the shedding of his blood for us, by his death, and passion completed on the cross. Doctrine. The, indo the doctrine I intend to handle is this, that the death of Jesus Christ is the procuring cause of man's justification and salvation. Amongst all these those heresies which God has suffered to spring among us, that they that are approved may be made manifest, 1 Corinthians 11.19, None are more dangerous than those which concern the person and office of Christ. Of those many streams of error which run into the Dead Sea of Socinianism, these are two. They deny the Godhead and satisfaction of Christ, and so indeed subvert the whole fabric of the Gospel. This latter I shall here endeavour to discuss, and shall proceed in this method. One, I shall explain it. Two, assert 
three defend and four apply it. One, for explication of this great gospel mystery, which truly, if it fall, we are without hope, and so are all creatures most miserable, I shall lay down these steps. One, God made the world and man in it for his own service and glory, and this end he cannot be disappointed in, but must have it one way or other. Two, man by sin thwarted God's end and cast dirt upon his glory, and so doth every sinner. Every sin is a reflection upon God's name, a blot in God's government of the world, so that some make it a pretense for the atheism, saying that if there were a God, he would not suffer sin to be in the world. 3. God is inclined by his nature, and obliged by his interest, to hate sin and punish the sinner, and so to recover his glory. 1. I say God is inclined by his nature to hate and punish sin. I do not positively conclude that he is absolutely obliged. I shall not here meddle with that nice question, whether what God was so far obliged to punish it by his nature, that he could not pardon sin without satisfaction. But this is manifest. Look upon man as a sinner, and so God's nature must needs be opposite unto him. The scripture describes God in such manner, not only in regard to his will, but also in respect of his nature. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Habakkuk 1.13 In Exodus 34.6 and 7, where the nature of the divine majesty is represented, among other parts of the description, this is one. He will by no means clear the guilty. The wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Psalm 11.5 and the reason is added from God's nature, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. Verse 7. And it may further appear that here punishment of sin is not an act of God's will, but of his nature, because the action of God, actions of God's will are only known by revelation, not by reason or the light of nature, but that God should and would punish sin. This was known by nature's light to such as were unacquainted with revelation light. Hence came the conclusion in Acts 28.4, This man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffers not to live. Vengeance, decay, a supposed goddess, but indeed nothing else but divine justice. 2. God is obliged by his interest to punish sin, as he is the ruler of the world. By sin there comes a double mischief. 1. God is wronged. And two, the world is wronged by a bad example and hardened in sin, so that if God might pardon sin, as it is a wrong to himself, yet he is in a manner obliged to punish it to right the wrong world, and to make such sin as patterns of severity, that the world may not make them examples of ungodliness. Even as King James might pardon the powder traitors, so far forth as his person was concerned, yet if you look on it as a wrong to the whole nation, to the Protestant religion, so he was obliged to punish them, to make them warnings to others in the like cases. So that, you see, man's punishment was necessary for God's glory and the world's good. For the punishment to be inflicted must be suitable to sin's nature and God's majesty, and therefore an infinite punishment. For this is justice, to observe an exact proportion between sin and punishment. 5. The only way whereby this punishment might be suffered, and yet man saved, was by the incarnation and passion of God-man. Man, being every other way finite, must have suffered infinitely in regard of duration even to eternity. And none but Christ, who was infinite in regard of the subject and dignity of his person, as he was God, could have so speedily and effectually delivered us from this punishment by suffering it himself, whereby God's justice was satisfied, his hatred against the sinner removed, and his mercy at liberty to act in the pardon of the sinner. This passion, six, this passion of Jesus Christ, God has graciously pleased to accept for us, and impute to us, as if we had suffered in our persons, and so he receives us in mercy. And this is the substance of the doctrine of the gospel about man's salvation. 
So much for the first thing, the explication of the point. Two, I now come to the assertion or demonstration of it, that you may receive this doctrine as a truth, not built upon the traditions of men, but revealed in the word of God. Now, to prove this point, namely, that the death of Jesus Christ is the procuring cause of man's justification and salvation, I may use two sorts of arguments. One, some from the consideration of Christ's death. Two, some from the consideration of man's justification and salvation. One, from the consideration of Christ's death. I shall offer six arguments. One, its possibility. Two, its necessity. Three, nature. Four, cause. Five, vicegerency. And six, peculiarity. One, from the possibility. Let me be bold to assert that had it not been for this purpose, it had not been possible for Christ to die, as it was not possible for Christ to be holden of death. Acts 2.24 the price being paid, and so the prisoner, of course, to be released. So it had not been possible, because not just to put him into a prison, if he had not been, to pay a debt. And a debt of his own he had none. He was a lamb without blemish and without spot, 1 Peter 1.19, holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, Hebrews 7.26. He knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21 which I the rather mention because Socinus had the impudence to lay down this blasphemous assertion that Christ like the Jewish high priest did offer for himself as well as for the people. You have seen he had no debt, no sin of his own. He professes on himself that he did always those things which pleased his father John 8.29 and therefore he must needs die for our debts. It is plain that Adam, had he continued in integrity, should not have died. Death is not the effect of nature. Then the saints in glory must die again, for they have the same nature. But the fruit of sin, death entered into the world by sin. Romans 5.12 And the apostle proves the sin of infants, expressed by the periphrasis, such as have not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Verse 14 from the death of infants, and in Adam all died, 1 Corinthians 15.22, that is, by his sin. Therefore Jesus Christ, being purified from the guilt of Adam's sin by his holy birth, and no less perfect than Adam should have been, could never have died, if not for our sakes. 2. From the necessity of Christ's death. It was necessary for our salvation and justification, without which it had been in vain. The Socinians mention two other reasons and ends of Christ's death. The one to be an example of obedience, but such we have many others upon far less charge. The other to be a ground of hope for the remission of sin and the fulfilling of God's promises. But properly it is not the death, but the resurrection of Christ, which is the ground of our hope. If Christ is not risen, your faith is vain, 1 Corinthians 15:14. So that those ends are improper and insufficient. And to strike it dead, I urge at one place. If righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Galatians 2:21. What can be more plain? If righteousness be not by Christ, so that the death of Christ is not the procuring cause of justification. Christ is dead in vain, and to no end, as Grotius and others rather understand, without any meritorious cause, that is, our sins. However, all comes to one. 3. From the nature of Christ's death. It is a sacrifice. This consists of two branches. 1. Sacrifices did expiate sin. And 2. Christ's death is a sacrifice and a sin-expiating sacrifice. 1. I say sacrifices did expiate sin. He shall put his hands upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Leviticus 1.4 
and many such places, and this they did typically, which strengthens the cause we have in hand, as representing and for signifying Christ, which without which it was not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins, Hebrews 10.4. And the sins pardoned under the Old Testament were pardoned through Christ, and not through any virtue of their sacrifices. Christ being a mediator for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, Hebrews 9.15. 2. And this brings in the second head that Christ's death is a sacrifice and a sin-expiating sacrifice if either the names or nature of it may be regarded. For the names and titles proper to sacrifices, they are attributed to it. And God doth not give flattering titles nor false names, but such as discover the nature of things. It is called orephorosphora, an obligation, or an ablation or offering up of himself with Ephesians 5.2, Elasmos, 1 John 2.2, 2, Elasterion, a propitiation, Romans 3.25, to omit others. And for the nature, by virtue hereof sin is atoned. He is our high priest for this end, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, Hebrews 2.17. pacify God, reconcile God, turn away his wrath. You meet with all things in Christ which concur to the making of a sacrifice. The priest, he is our high priest. The sacrifice, himself. Christ was once offered, Hebrews 9.28, shedding of blood and destroying of it, being the essential part of the sacrifice. Add to these 1 Corinthians 5.7, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us, where is a double argument that Christ is expressly said to be sacrificed, to that he is called a Passover, which at the least seems to have been a sacrifice and a sacrament. Now then, Christ's death being a sacrifice, it appears that at peace God's wrath procured his favour. 4. From the cause of Christ's death, I might urge a double cause. One, the inflicting cause. It was God's displeasure. Nothing is more plain than that he had a very deep sense of and sharp conflict with God's wrath from those dreadful horrors in the garden where his soul was exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Matthew 26, 38. Not certainly at the approach of an ordinary death which many martyrs have undergone with undaunted courage, but at the apprehension of his father's anger, and upon the cross, where he roared out that direful complaint, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. Now then, seeing God, being naturally gracious and perfectly righteous, cannot, will not be displeased with any without cause, and Christ had in himself no cause, there was nothing in him, John 14.30, and as you read, he always did those things which pleased him, the Father, John 8.29. It remains, therefore, that the cause of this displeasure and of Christ's death was our sins laid upon him and our peace to be procured by him. And that brings in the second head, which is, too, the procuring or meritorious cause of Christ's death. The guilt of our sins laid on him brought death upon him as a just punishment of them. And this is written with so much clearness that he that runs may read it. It is observed of the ancient writers of the church that those of them who lived before the Pelagian heresy was raised spoke more darkly and doubtfully and carelessly in these those things, not being obliged to stand much upon their guard when they had no enemy in view and having to do with enemies of a contrary make, while they avoided one extreme by excess of counterbalancing, as it often happened, they ran too near the other. But in this point, the apostles, who wrote so long before Socinus had a being, have written with as much perspicuity against that heresy as if they had lived to see the accomplishment of that monster, 
the conception whereof some of them saw in their those primitive heretics. Two things are written with a sunbeam. One, that Christ died for our good as a final cause. The Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Daniel 9.26 2. That he died for our sins as a deserving cause. Who was delivered, namely, unto death for our offences? Romans 4.25 Not only upon the occasion of our sins, as the Socinians gloss it, but for the merit of our sins. To suffer for sin always implies sin to be the meritorious cause of it. He shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, 1 Corinthians 14, 1 Kings 14, 16. The father shall not be put to death for the children, neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers, but every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Deuteronomy 24, 16. And many other places there are to the same purpose. And it is sufficient to confirm any judicious man in this truth to read the miserable evasions which the Socinians used to shift off the force of this argument, which as time will not give me leave to mention, so they are neither fit for this nor worthy of any assembly. This is plain, that Christ died for our sins, and to stuff all holes, the Holy Ghost useth various prepositions. If one be more emphatical than another, all shall concur to assert this truth. Dear Ta O Raptomata, Romans 4.25, Hopper O Matium, 1 Corinthians 15.3, and Ori O Matium, Epapathen, 2 Peter 3.18, and that all these should signify the final cause or occasion only, and never the meritorious cause. When a, hand, a man hath put out his eyes, or God hath taken away the scripture, and other Greek authors too, he may believe it, but very hardly before. I shall strengthen this argument with this consideration, that Christ is said to bear our sins, which is so evident that Crelius, that master builder of the Socinian fabric, confesses that, for the most part, to bear sins, is to endure the punishments due to sin. And he said no more than he was forced to by the invincible clearness of scripture expressions. Notorious offenders, it is said of them, that they shall bear their iniquity. Leviticus 5, 1, 7, 18, 10, 17. It is said of Christ, not only, which the associates say may signify to take away iniquity, or be a learned man let down this assertion, that it never signifies to take away sin, as Socinus would have it, but also, which is to bear upon his shoulders, as a porter bears a burden, but never to take away. He hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Isaiah 53, 4. Objection, which is one of the most plausible arguments they have in this cause. But in Matthew 8, 1617, where Christ took away diseases, which he did not bear, it is said that the saying of Isaiah was fulfilled therein. Answer. To omit those many answers given by others, of which see Brinsley, one only mediator, and Calovius, excellent discourse, a scripture is said to be fulfilled, either wholly or in part. Now then, you must know that although it be a truth, which we conclude against the Papists, that there are no more than one no more than one of literal and coordinate senses of every place of scripture, yet there may be divers of several kinds, one subordinate to another, and one typified by another, and one accommodated to another. And when any one of these senses is accomplished, that scripture is said to be fulfilled, though indeed but one piece and parcel of it be fulfilled. Thus the fulfilling of the same scripture is applied to the scriptural, spiritual preservation of the apostles, John 17.12, and to the temporal preservation of them, John uh, 18.9. And as it were false and fallacious reasoning for any man to infer 
the Christ's keeping of his apostles cannot be understood spiritually of keeping them in his name and keeping them from apostasy, as it is said in John 17.12, because in John 18.9 it is said to be fulfilled in a rescue of them from a temporal destruction. But rather it must be said it was fulfilled both ways and the one was subordinate to the other and typified in the other. So it is in this case. This place in Isaiah, and it may appear to be exactly a parallel case, was fulfilled two ways. The one expressed in 1 Peter 2.24, whose own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. And the other is this, Matthew 8.17. In the former is expressed the cause, Christ bearing the burden of our sins upon his shoulders. In the latter, the effect, Christ taking off the burden or part of that burden of sin from our shoulder or from the shoulders of those diseased persons for it was laid upon his shoulders then it might be taken off from us. So that Matthew rightly tells us that Isaiah was fulfilled and that the cause did appear by the effect as by the dawning of the day we see the approach of the sun. And this may serve for the untying of that hard knot which I had almost said is the only thing of moment that the Socinians have in this controversy. But to return. But to return. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed Isaiah 53, 5. If it were lawful for the highest anti in the world to coin a scripture for his purpose, he could not devise a place of a more favourable aspect to his cause than this. And verse 6, The Lord hath placed on him the iniquity of us all. But, indeed, the arguments which might be drawn out of this one chapter, Isaiah 53, might afford matter for a whole sermon. 5. From the vincigerency of Christ's death, Christ died. One, for our good. Two, for our sins, or both those you have heard. Three, in our place. Of this I now come to treat briefly, for I have been wonderfully prevented. Christ has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. 1 Peter 3.18 if one died for all, then were all, then were we all dead. 2 Corinthians 5.14 That is, juridically, we were all as dead, condemned persons, because he died in our stead. He is said to die, hupa homon and anti homon, for us and instead of us. Now the word anti always signifies a commutation. Seth the then famous but afterwards apostate Grotius, eye for eye, anti ophthalmu, Matthew 5.38, that is, one instead of the other. Archelaus reigned anti atros in the room of his father Herod, Matthew 2.22. So to Samuel, 18.33, would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, that is, in thy stead, so that thou hast lived. Thus Christ died for us. So in John 11.50, Caiaphas said, It is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, that is, in their stead, to save their lives as a public expiatory sacrifice. The Gentiles being used, in case of some great and common calamity threatening destruction to all, to offer up some one man in the name instead of all, which was a shadow of that great truth of Christ dying for all. And so Sinus himself, being put to it, cannot deny this. Even in Eden authors, it is a common phrase, to do a thing for another, that is in his place. Ergo pro temulam, I will grind for you, and you shall be free. Christ is called Antilutron, a ransom or price. A lutron, there is one argument that his blood was the price of our redemption. 
and a ransom in our stead. He who gave himself anti lutron a ransom for all. 1 Timothy 2.6 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, himself being made a curse for us. Galatians 3.13 that, that is, he underwent that curse due to us, that curse from which we are freed, that curse which others who receive not Jesus Christ shall undergo. What a cluster of arguments might be gathered here. It is prodigious boldness in such sins to turn this article of faith into a stream of rhetoric. Six, and lastly, from the peculiarity of Christ's death, it is undeniable that Christ died for us so, as no man in the world ever did or can do. Therefore, not in the Socinian sense, not barely for the confirmation of our faith, or excitation, excitation of our obedience, or strengthening of our hope, or encouraging of us in our sufferings. For in this sense, thousands have died for you. Paul tells the Colossians that he suffered for them, that is, for their good. Colossians 1.24 And yet tells the Corinthians that he did not suffer for them. Was Paul crucified for you? 1 Corinthians 1.13 that is, in your stead, or for your sins? Two. And this, for the first head of arguments, where I see I must take up, though in my thought I have urged divers other arguments, from the nature of men's justification and salvation. But I will not be too tedious. What I have been said may be enough to convince any indifferent man, and others will not be convinced, though they are convinced. Thus much for the second particular the assertion of this truth. Three. The third should have been the vindication of it from the cavils of Socinians. But I am cut off, and is not wholly necessary. For if once a truth be evident from plain scriptures, we ought not to be moved with the cavils of wanton wits, or the difficulty of comprehending those great mysteries by our reason. When the Socinians can resolve all the phenomena of nature, which are the proper object of man's reason, then, and not till then, we will hearken to their rational objections. And Aristotle somewhere lays down this conclusion, that when once a man is well settled in any truth, he ought not to be moved from it by, any, by some subtle objection which he cannot well answer. All this I speak, not as if there were any insolubilia, any insuperable objections against this truth that I have ever met with, for though there are many things here which are hard to be understood, yet nothing which cannot be answered. As when they tell you, he did not suffer eternal death, which was due to us. It is true, he did not. But a moment of his sufferings was equal in worth to our eternal sufferings. The dignity of the person being always considerable in the estimation of the action or the suffering. So when they say, one man cannot die for another, it is false. You heard David wish that he had died for Absalom, and Jehu threatens those who should let any of them escape, that his life shall go for his life. To Kings 10.24 And histories tell us of one man dying for another. So when they say it is unrighteous that God should punish the just for the unjust, answer, it is not unjust, if any will voluntarily undertake it. Besides that, God gives law to us in Deuteronomy 24, 16, but not to himself. 4. The fourth and last head was by way of application. It is so that the death of Jesus Christ is the procuring cause of our justification and salvation. Uses. Use 1. Hence see the excellency of, Christ, of Christian religion, which shows the true way of life and settles doubting consciences. Heathens were miserably plunged. They saw their sins, their guilt, and had terrors of conscience, an expectation of wrath. This di dioma to theo, judgment of God, was written in their hearts, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Romans 1.32 They saw the need of atoning God, reconciling God, 
They saw the insufficiency of all their rites and sacrifices. Some of them saw the necessity of a man's death, and that, without man's blood, the work could not be done. But then that seemed an act of cruelty, an addition of a sin, instead of an expiation of it. And here they stuck, they could go no further. Now, blessed be God, who hath discovered those things to us, which were hid from others, who hath removed difficulties and made our way plain before us, who have given us a sacrifice and accepted it and imputed it to us, and thereby reconciled us and given us peace, a solid peace, as a fruit of that reconciliation. Use two. See the dreadfulness of God's justice. How fearful it is to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10.31 Christ himself must suffer, if he be a sinner, though not by imputation. Use 3. It shows us the malignity of sin that could be expiated only by such blood. And use 4. It shows us the stability and certainty of our justification and salvation. It is procured, purchased, the price paid, received. God cannot now recall it. Use 5. Study the death of Christ, and eye it as the great pillar of your faith in troubles of conscience, and settle yourselves upon it. This Reformation audio track is a production of Stillwater's Revival Books. You are welcome to make copies and give them to those in need. SWRB makes thousands of classic Reformation resources available, free and for sale, in audio, video, and printed formats. It is likely that the sermon or book that you just listened to is also available on cassette or video, or as a printed book or booklet. Our many free resources, as well as our complete mail-order catalog, containing thousands of classic and contemporary Puritan and Reformed books, tapes, and videos at great discounts, is on the web at www.swrb.com. We can also be reached by email at swrb at swrb.com, by phone at 780-450-3730, by fax at 780-468-1096, or by mail at 4710-37A Avenue, Edmonton, that's E-D-M-O-N-T-O-N, Alberta, abbreviated capital A, capital B, Canada, T6L, 3T5. You may also request a free printed catalog. And remember that John Calvin, in defending the Reformation's regulative principle of worship, or what is sometimes called the scriptural law of worship, commenting on the words of God, which I commanded them not, neither came into my heart, from his commentary on Jeremiah 7.31, writes, God here cuts off from men every occasion for making evasions, since he condemns by this one phrase, I have not commanded them, whatever the Jews devised. There is then no other argument needed to condemn superstitions than that they are not commanded by God. For when men allow themselves to worship God according to their own fancies, and attend not to his commands, they pervert true religion. And if this principle was adopted by the Papists, all those fictitious modes of worship in which they absurdly exercise themselves would fall to the ground. It is indeed a horrible thing for the Papists to seek to discharge their duties towards God by performing their own superstitions. There is an immense number of them, as it is well known, and as it manifestly appears. Were they to admit this principle, that we cannot rightly worship God except by obeying his word, they would be delivered from their deep abyss of error. The prophet's words, then, are very important. When he says that God had commanded no such thing, and that it never came to his mind, as though he had said that men assume too much wisdom when they devise what he never required, nay, what he never knew.